Brother Troy Salinger, welcome to Unitarian Anabaptist. Thank you. Yes. So we met in White House, Tennessee, four years ago. We met each other in the hallway, and now we're conducting this interview. So how? tell the audience your story. How did you go from Trinitarianism to Unitarianism and uh, start a blog? Well, uh, I've been a believer for 43 years, uh, 35 years as a Trinitarian, and the past eight years as a Biblical Unitarian. Um, my, the way I became a Biblical Unitarian is, uh, it's not a very long story. It was a very quick um, conversion, actually. Um, I wasn't doubting the Trinity. I wasn't uh, looking to find out uh, anything about the Trinity. I, I was fine with it. I'd, I'd always believed it, always defended it, although I probably couldn't explain it very well back then. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't have a problem with it. So, I, you know, I wasn't like uh, troubled by it and was searching online, everything I could find to give me a different, uh, you know, an alternative viewpoint. It was nothing like that. Uh, I just happened to be doing a study of the four Gospels, and um, basically I was trying to study the four Gospels from a Hebraic perspective. In other words, oh. uh, reading it through the lens of the Hebrew Bible. Okay. And uh, when I got to the, the title, Son of God, in Luke 1, I decided to see what that meant from a Hebraic perspective. All right. And I discovered something I had never really, I'd never knew before. I never saw it myself in, in, in the scripture, nor had I ever heard anyone teach on it, or anyone present this information from the pulpit or in any commentaries or anything. I found out Son of God was a title for the King of Israel. And um, that just changed, that, that alone just changed everything for me. As soon as I found that out, and going back to Luke 1 and seeing where the angel tells Mary, uh, the one born of you, you know, will be uh, be great. He will be called the son of the Most High. Okay. And God will give him the throne of his father David. He will rule over the house of Israel forever. And I, I was it. It settled it for me right there. Uh, huh. I didn't really, it didn't, it wasn't a long road of, you know, looking through all the passages to see how I could figure it out. When when I came to that realization, I knew that what I had been believing for thirty five years was wrong. Wow! It was just that quick. It was it was really revel revelational, you know. Uh, okay, so you're talking about the birth narrative of Jesus. You came across this in the birth narrative. Yeah. And yeah. you suddenly converted to Unitarian thinking, a Unitarian mindset. That's fascinating. Yeah, okay. now, you know, when I came across that, I, I knew right then and there that I couldn't believe Jesus was an eternally begotten Son of God. Uh, you know, but for about a couple of weeks, I really didn't know how to think about Jesus, okay, I have to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, I was a little confused about how to think of him, but I, for some reason, my mind never went to just the simple truth that he was a human being. Oh. And then I was doing some, uh, I was, then I started looking online for some help uh, trying to explain some uh, passages like Colossians 1. And I happened to come across Anthony Buzzard and Dan okay. Gill. I'd never heard of them before, but they were doing a teaching on Colossians 1. And they were presenting Jesus as a purely human person. And when I heard that, it just like clicked in my mind. And that, that was it. You know, I had been praying, God, show me what, how to think about your son, because I really, I was confused about it. Uh, and, that, and that was it. That was the answer. It just clicked like that. So, uh, I, I mean, literally within a two-week period, I went from being a Trinitarian <laughs> to a Biblical Unitarian without ever like researching it. <laughs> 
you okay. know, or, or ever doubting the Trinity or anything like that. So interesting. It, it was, yeah. It was so you were 55 years old at the time. Is that uh, correct? Or 56? 54, 54 maybe. 54? Uh, yeah, I just made 62, so yeah, eight, okay. eight years ago. Okay. So what, can you, on the topic of the Son of God as the title for the King of Israel, can you do a little bit of explanation on this? Like, how is this term Son of God used in the Old Testament? Who is it being used for? In what context? Yeah, so you, you first see it in, uh, after David becomes, officially becomes king of all of Israel after a long waiting period. Um, the God sends the prophet Nathan to him uh, to give him a promise uh, about that, you know, the promise was basically that the kingship would belong to David and his descendants forever. Okay. Uh, so God made a covenant with him. But in, in gi giving that covenant, what God said to him was that out of David's own seed, God would raise up someone after him, you know, his son, uh, to, to be king. And that God says, and I, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And then you see this same promise reiterated a few times in uh, First Chronicles as David himself is relating this revelation that God gave him. And he's, and he's talking about Solomon following him uh, you know, to take the throne after him. And he repeats this promise that God said that he would be a father to Solomon. Solomon would be his son. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, you have Psalm 2, which is a, a royal psalm in which I know a lot of people take Psalm 2 to be prophetic of, of Jesus, but actually the psalm, most scholars, Old Testament scholars agree, the psalm is a uh, coronation psalm, okay? Uh, probably uh, for the coronation of Solomon. And in the psalm, uh, David says, I will recall the decree of Yahweh. Uh, and, where Yahweh and then he says that uh, Yahweh says, uh, this day uh, I will be a father, I will be your father, this day I have begotten you, or something like that. Okay. Uh, and in the psalm, the king is called the son the son of God. So, uh, you know, that just became a, a, a way of, you know, in, in the Hebrew mind to think of the king as a son of God. But this, this idea of a king being the son of, of a God was very typical in, in the A&E period, uh, the, the ancient Near East. Uh, okay. That was quite often the way kings were viewed. They were, they were viewed as reigning in for on behalf of a of a god, and that in that sense they were the son of the god that they were reigning on behalf of. Okay. And so this same idea came down through into the Israelite uh, concept of a king, so that the king uh, was ruling in God's place. God is the king of of His kingdom, which is Israel, and but. Uh, he's reigning through a human agent, we could say. Okay. So in the case of Jesus, there has been a long time since there was a king reigning over Israel, even over Judah. There's been a period of how long? Uh, over 500 years, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost 600 years since there was a king over either Israel or Judah. Now, David and Solomon, Solomon were kings over the entirety of Israel. Exactly. The kingdom was divided after Solomon into two. That is Israel in the north or Samaria and Judah in the south. And now you have this figure, Jesus, who is called the Son of God, who is going to be given the kingdom of his father, David. And 
so how does this fit into the to the messianic Jewish mindset of the day? Like the idea of Jesus as being the son of David and reigning over the kingdom of David, is that very central to the messianic expectations of Israel, of Judah? Oh, yes, very, very much. Uh, yeah, the, the Jews of, of Jesus' day, those that were expecting a, a Messiah to come, uh, definitely saw him as a, we could say, a political figure, okay? Not that, it, that it's completely political. Uh, the king of Israel always held a, a place um, as really as God's chief representative on earth, really. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's always a, you know, you want to say a religious connotation to it. Uh, we could say that the, the kingdom of Israel was a theocratic kingdom, though it was, reign, it was reigned over by a human being. That human being was reigning in place of Yahweh. Right. And we even we even get in uh, the chronicles uh, that the king is sitting on the throne of Yahweh. <laughs> yes. So, so it's Yahweh's kingdom. It's Yahweh's throne, uh, and he gives it over to a human agent to reign in his place. And he promised this to David and his descendants alone, so that only descendants of David would have this position and this status. Uh, so yes, by the time uh, once the the dynasty of David, in a sense, was was uh, fallen down, you could say, was destroyed uh, in the Babylonian siege on uh, Jerusalem and the conquest. Uh, you went into this long period of you know before from that from that time until Jesus about you know, five, maybe 600 years, uh, where there was no Davidic king on the throne. There was no king at, at all reigning on the throne. Uh, wow. Israel was controlled and ruled over by different Gentile world powers. Uh -huh. um, but there was, a, there was this hope, you know, that was still alive in some of the Israelites that God would restore the dynasty of David and the kingship and this would be a restoration of the kingdom of God on, upon the earth. Yes. Uh, it's necessary for the kingdom of God to be upon the earth. It's necessary to have a Davidic descendant reigning on the throne. Okay. Okay. Just Israel being in the land by themselves doesn't constitute the kingdom of God without a Davidic king reigning over them. Okay. So... When John the Baptist comes along after this, you know, long period of there is no king, uh, there is no kingdom of Israel. Uh, John the Baptist comes along and he starts proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, surely this could only mean one thing to the people of Israel at that time. Okay. And that is that God was about to restore the kingdom of God. Uh, to the people of Israel uh, under the rule of a Davidic descendant. Uh, okay, that, so the way yeah. that you're describing this, there's like a, five, say, 500 or longer year period where there was no king in Israel, and now, like, breaking forth on the scene in order to fulfill the hopes and expectations of a remnant of the people, their long expected Messiah is going to come. And John the Baptist is a prophet of the Lord who is announcing the arrival of this messianic king. Yes. Well, that's quite an incredible thought, is it not? It is. It is. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of Christians have come to a, a belief about the kingdom that that really um, it obscures the the truth about what what was going on in the first century when John the Baptist shows up 
because uh, Christianity has come, you know, to see the kingdom of God mainly as a kind of an invisible thing, uh, mm -hmm. a spiritual thing, something that's only in the heart maybe, or the church itself is the kingdom, uh, something like that. They they don't really grasp or catch the, the significance of what is going on when John shows up saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, but if we, if we go back and we look at the promises that God gave of restoration, because God did, get, did predict the fall of the Davidic kingdom, but he also predicted its restoration. <laughs> All right? Um, so the first one was fulfilled, the fall, and so the Jews were looking forward to the fulfillment, I mean, the restoration of, of the fallen kingdom. Uh, and, they, and they were looking for it in quite a quite literal sense, okay? And, and they were not wrong for thinking that, okay? Uh, I know it became the popular thing in the early church fathers to belittle the, the Jewish way of thinking about a literal uh, kingdom because the early church fathers had abandoned that view sometime in probably from starting from the probably the late third century. And it, and it, as time went on, it became more and more the dominant view that no, it's not a literal kingdom that we're waiting for. The kingdom's already here. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's the church. And, and by then, you know, by the fourth century, the church had, uh, you know, by the end of the fourth century, the church had pretty much become wedded to the state, and hey, they they were ruling the world, okay? Yes. Uh, yes. And so they looked at that as the fulfillment of the of the kingdom of, of God. Okay. Uh, but that's not what no Jew would have th thought that or expected that in the first century when John came along saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, and then Yeshua himself comes along and after John and he repeats the same thing, right? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The, the, the thing is, if, if, if Jesus or John had meant some different kingdom than what the prophets had foretold and a uh, different kingdom than what the Jews of that time were, were hoping in and waiting for, uh, it seems that they would have been as, as the chief prophet of, in Israel at that time and as a chief rabbi at that time, uh, both John and, and Yeshua would have been derelict in their duties to not explain to the people, hey, I'm, I'm, we're talking about a different kingdom here, okay? Oh, yeah. We're talking about something different than what the prophets foretold and what you've been <laughs> hoping for and waiting for. Right. But they, they didn't do that. They just proclaimed the message as if they were expecting the Jews at that time to understand what they were saying. Okay. Uh, and so we can only, you know, surmise from that that what John and Yeshua were proclaiming was that the kingdom, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel under a Davidic king was about to take place. Now, I take a little different view from, you know, what a lot of believers do about the kingdom of uh, uh, I actually, I wrote an article on this. It's called The Postponement of the Kingdom. Uh, and I actually did an uh, interview with uh, Sean... Uh, Finnegan? Finnegan on, on, his, uh, on his podcast about this, uh, the article that I wrote. Uh, but the, the idea that, you know, that the, the kingdom was meant in one sense, to be established at that time in the first century. Mm -hmm. But it was contingent upon the acceptance of Yeshua as that king by the uh -huh. Jerusalem leadership. Yes. Uh, the, but so the Jerusalem leadership rejecting Yeshua as the Messiah, as the Davidic king, as the, you know, the hope uh, of the one who was going to restore the kingdom 
the, the throne of David and the kingdom of Israel uh, because they rejected him and they led the people to reject him, uh, that the fulfillment of it was in a sense pulled back, okay, was uh, postponed, we, we could say, uh, until a further time. And then God began to uh, do something different in the earth in calling out the Gentiles and, uh, you know, establishing the ecclesia uh, made up of Jews and Gentiles in the world. Uh, but this is not the kingdom of God. This is not what the prophets foretold, okay? What, when we look into the world right now, is we don't see the kingdom of God reigning on the earth. No. We see the kingdoms of this world uh, are still intact. They're still going full force. And so we are still in a waiting period right now, waiting for the Messiah to return, and at which time he will uh, restore the Davidic dynasty, the throne of David, and the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of God upon the earth, and it will be everything that the prophets said it would be and foretold. Uh, but it's not it's not here right now. I know a lot of Christians think that a lot of Christians. I don't even know what your view is on that. I mean, you you may hold to some. No, it's actually pretty similar to your own. Is it almost really? identical? I would say, or perhaps okay. identical. Well, good. Yes. Uh, but a lot of Christians do have. You know, either that the kingdom of God is here now in in its fullness, and this is all it's ever going to be. There's nothing really that we're waiting for. Some Christians hold to what what they call an already but not yet view, like it's already here but not yet in its fullness. There may be some truth to that. Uh, I personally don't. I say the kingdom of God is not here at all. <laughs> It's just not here. Okay. Not the kingdom foretold by the Hebrew prophets. Uh, now, you want to say, you know, you want to talk about some other kind of kingdom that the prophets didn't tell us about? Uh, well, okay. But if we're going to talk about the prophets, uh, the kingdom foretold by the prophets, it's not here. Uh, who, how can you look at the world and think the kingdom of God is here? It's just oh, not. No. No. So we're waiting for that day where, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Yes, amen. So this was the prayer of the early church, that, the, that our Lord Jesus Christ would return and bring with him the reign and rule of God. Yes. So that's your view. You have a first century view on the return of Jesus and the coming kingdom. Yeah, I do. I believe it literally. Uh, I, I think the apostles believed it that way. Now you know, there's you know, there's always uh, no matter what view you hold about the kingdom, there's always some passages that are going to be more difficult for you to, uh, you know, make fit your view. Uh, but in my article on the postponement of the kingdom. Actually, you know, actually, I gave a, I, I give a, uh, I actually had a three-part article on the kingdom of God. Huh. Uh, three parts. Uh, I did that earlier. Uh, the first, first part explains what the kingdom is, its relation to the nation of Israel, and uh, how it was foretold by the prophets. What it is, it's a restoration of the kingdom of Israel under a. Davidic king. Uh, and then in part two, I get into uh, I forget exactly what part two is about, but uh, it's further ex explication of, of the kingdom. And then part three, I answer a lot of the passages that seem to, might seem to say that the kingdom is already a present reality. Uh, I give answers to those passages in the Gospels. Okay, so I was just thinking about Mark chapter 1. Jesus, the first words that come out of Jesus' mouth 
when he begins voicing the gospel message. Do you remember that passage, Brother Troy? Uh, I can look it up real quick. Okay. All right, so the first thing Yeshua says. Our first thing Yeshua, maybe it's not chapter one, is it? Um, oh. I think yeah, verse, four, uh, ver verse 15, oh, verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Yes. Is that what you were looking for? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is Jesus actually saying here? as this representative of God. What's he declaring? Yeah, well, like I said, uh, if he was declaring some mystical kingdom uh, that the Jews were uninformed about, uh, that the prophets did not predict, uh -huh. um, that no one had imagined was going to come, but if Jesus was proclaiming that kind of a kingdom, uh, it would have been a deceptive message because the Jews would have heard his words and the only thing they would have been able to think he was saying was what the prophets had predicted. So what you're saying here, like when we, when we read this passage, for us it's actually too simple, right? What? Is this a gospel message that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe this? But apparently he was expecting his audience to know what this meant. Exactly. I mean, why would we not assume that, right? I mean, he's preaching a message. When a preacher preaches a message, he preaches it in such a way that the people can grasp what he's saying. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So, or, or his efforts are, are fruitless. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, uh, he, he doesn't have to explain what he means because everybody knows what he means. Okay. Now, what, you know, what, again, what has happened is over, you know, <clears throat> over time as a, as a, you know, 300 or more years later, after this time, after Jesus said that, uh, the kingdom of God is, is changed into something completely different. And then that's right back into, into Jesus' words. Yes. But, but like I'm saying, no, no Jew in his audience, in the crowds hearing him say this, would have had the idea that came along 300 years later of what the kingdom of God was. Uh -huh. They yes. wouldn't have heard that. They wouldn't have understood that. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, so I think it. So he had an audience that he expected to be able to interpret these simple words that he was saying, and the fact that Jesus was the seed of David through his father Joseph. How significant is this? to Jesus being able to lay claim to this, this title of it's, the Son of God, the yeah, Son it's of completely, David. It's completely significant. Uh, he, he would not, unless he was a descendant of David, uh, he would have no claim to the, okay. Very good. To the throne. Uh, that, that promise was given to David by covenant that, that only from David and his line would king sit on the throne. Okay. Okay. So, uh, others tried. You know, others attempted to do it. Uh, in fact, the, the Herods uh, were not of the line of David. Uh, no. But they were placed in power by Rome. Uh, so their kingships were were illegitimate. We could say. Um, and they certainly were no restoration of the kingdom of God. You know. On the sure. earth. Again, that can only take place under the reign of a, of a Davidic king. 
So when Jesus shows up on the scene with this message, there was already a pretty well-established political framework in the land at the time. You mentioned that Rome had appointed the puppet regime of Herod, and the Jewish l religious leaders had a affiliation. They were interwoven into the political fabric of the day. Is that safe to say? Oh, yeah, I would say that, yes. Mm -hmm. So is that I why mean, Jesus had such a tough time gaining acceptance, especially among the ruling class? Uh, they, they kind of, you know, the, you get little nuggets here and there in the Gospels uh, as to what might be the thinking behind the religious leaders. Uh, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of the passages right now, but, um, you know, one, one time I think uh, they say, you know, when they, they gather together, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin or whatever, they, they gather together and they and they say something like, you know, if we don't do something about this guy, uh, you know, he's going to bring Rome's uh, wrath down upon us and we're going to sure. lose our position, you know, right. in a sense. They're yes. going to lose their, their power, right? Because the Jews, although they were, you know, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the high priest and his family and and uh, you know some of the other uh, among in within the Sanhedrin, the, the wealthy uh, priestly families, <clears throat> they they although they were under Rome's control, they had a lot of leeway, okay, and and they were able to exercise a pretty good bit of power and authority within Israel, and. Uh, Hey, like a lot of people, you know, they when, once you get a taste of power, you hate to give it up. You know? Okay. Uh, now they could have reigned with with the King Yeshua uh, had they submitted to him and bowed the knee to him. Uh, Yeshua would have shared his reign with them, and but uh, they would have none of it. You know, even in a parable uh, Jesus told about. Uh, I think it's the parable of the vineyard. Uh, God plants a vineyard, which represents Israel. He rents it out uh, to people to take care of it. This would be a reference to the religious leaders. Yes. Uh, and then he sends prophets to them uh, over time, and they reject the words of the prophets. They cast them out. Uh, of the vineyard and he sends more prophets. Mm -hmm. They kill some of them. And eventually he says, I'm gonna send my son. And he sends his son and the uh, religious leaders say, oh, here is the son of the, of the uh, vineyard owner. Let's kill him and take the inheritance for ourselves. Okay, so, you know, whether that is given an accurate um, uh, depiction of what was motivating these religious leaders uh, or if that was just, you know, rhetorical hyperbole within the parable, you know, uh, I think it gives insight into what oh, their yes, motivation sure. was, you know, yes. so what, what was in their thinking. If we go back to the first words that Jesus is recorded as speaking, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. Do you think that Jesus knew at that point whether or not his message would be re accepted by Judah? Uh, I'm going to say no. Okay. I'm going to say, you know, and a lot of believers are going to disagree with no, me. I, about who cares? And that's, <laughs> and that's fine, right. Yes. Uh, but this is how I see it. Uh, I see that there was a point uh, early on in his ministry, it was still open as to whether uh, 
the kingdom of God would be then established or not. Okay, yes. there was still the possibility that if the religious leaders repented, gathered around Yeshua, uh, acknowledged him as the promised one, yes. anointed him, brought him before the people, told the people, this is our anointed one, let us rally to him. Okay. And he, and he will deliver us from the dominion and power of Rome. I, I think it would have happened at that time. So the, it was still open, and but at some point, obviously, in, in the ministry of Jesus, uh, the unbelief reached its peak, and, and the door was closed, in a sense. Okay. And, and God withdrew the, uh, the near fulfillment of that prophecy, of the prophecies, uh, until he withdrew that until a later time. So it and, just seems to me when, when Jesus was making this declaration that he would have had to have thought that this was actually a possibility. Like he's preaching this as if there was a possibility that Israel would turn and accept him as the son of David, the king of Israel, and that they would be blessed by God for doing so. So in order for Jesus to start on this track, he it seems like he had to have this type of understanding. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see how you can escape that uh, fact. Uh, I know a lot of Christians are going to have a problem with that because they like to see everything, you know, as being, in a sense, predetermined and, mm -hmm. you know, like there's no no contingency in what God is going to do. But if, if you, I mean, if you read the history of Israel, I mean, I don't know how you could come to that conclusion. No, I don't know either. Uh, let's, let's, let me give you a good example. When, when God delivered the, the, the people of Israel out of Egypt, his will and his purpose and plan was to immediately bring them to the promised land, mm -hmm. to the land of Canaan. They should have been into the promised land within, you know, maybe four months after leaving Egypt. They got all the way up to the borders of, of, the, of Canaan, and Moses, uh, I don't remember if God told him to do it or not. I'd have to go look that up. But Moses sends 12 spies into the land yes. to spy it out. Uh, before they go in and take it. Well, you, 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 know, you know the story. The 12 spies come back. Ten of them spread a negative report saying, yes. there's no way we can go in and take the land. The people are too tall. They're too strong. The cities are walled. There's no way we can go in and take it. And God becomes angry with the people and, uh, because they basically that's a declaration of unbelief in, in Yahweh. Okay. Yes. He told them to go in and take the land and he would fight for them and he would deliver the land into their possession. And they just doubted it. Uh, after all they had seen, uh, they, they doubted the word of Yahweh. And so, as a result, God says that none of the people who came out of Egypt 20 years and up will ever enter that land. And in order to accomplish that, he has them wander around in the desert for 40 years. Yes. Okay? Yep. So what, what originally should have only taken four months, and God, it was God's will for them to come out of Egypt and go straight to Canaan land. But it was contingent upon their, their faith in Yahweh and their obedience to his command. And his yes, command was to go in and take the land. So yes. that, that's a contingency that postponed their entrance into, the, into mm -hmm. their, their inheritance, okay? Uh, and so I see, I see it, the same thing in, in what happened in the first century when Yeshua came. He was coming to restore the kingdom of Israel and the the throne of David and 
to deliver the, uh, Israel from Gentile domination and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. But the people, the leadership, and the people followed the leadership. They rejected him as the king. And therefore, that fulfillment of those promises was postponed and was drawn back and postponed till a future date. So just out of a just out of interest, if Jesus had been enthroned at that time mm-hmm. by the will of the people, mm-hmm. and he's bringing the message of love your enemy, um, you know, these these incredible incredibly different and foreign thoughts to the to what you actually read in the Old Testament. I mean, Jesus is not the type of king that would destroy his enemies and subjugate people in ways that, say, King David did. What what do you imagine the kingdom would look like in Israel had they accepted Jesus? Yeah, well, Is that something you've <laughs> ever entertained? Oh, oh, sure, yeah, yeah. It's uh, interesting to think about those things. Mm-hmm. Of course, anything we say is, you know, is conjecture. We don't know exactly how it would have panned out. Um, as far as the thing about, you know, Yeshua being a different kind of king that wouldn't subjugate other peoples, uh, yeah, I I don't know if I really believe that. (laughs) No. Uh, You know, we do get still in, in New Testament, uh, prophecy that, that Yeshua is going to come again and he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Um, We get that he's going to, uh, I mean, depending on how you take the book of Revelation, uh, and of course there's, you know, a wide range of views on the book of Revelation, but um, from a premillennial perspective, we still have a portrait of Yeshua as coming and destroying the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people uh, in in the book of Revelation. Uh, We also get it in Paul. Paul says the same thing, uh, that in the coming of the Lord, he's going to, um, it's going to mean not only salvation for those mm-hmm. that are waiting for him, but it's going to mean destruction for those who are not waiting for him and who are or have been mistreating his people uh, for so many centuries. Um, so it's hard to for me to escape that uh, that portrait of Yeshua acting as the uh, we might say uh, the agent of God in in meeting out a retributive vengeance upon upon the enemies of God and God's people. That portrait uh, comes right out of uh, the Hebrew Bible, right into the New Testament. Okay, uh, in spite of those passages that seem to portray Jesus as something different than that in the Gospels. Uh-huh. Uh, I think maybe we we have might have been misreading those passages in, to some degree. Um, so I wonder if I could reference Paul's famous First Corinthians fifteenth chapter, where he is saying the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So if if Jesus is the one who brings life to those that will follow him. And death is a consequence that existed before Jesus comes on the scene. Men, before Jesus came on the scene, there was the decree of death for all human beings. And now Jesus is bringing the hope of resurrection life to all those that believe. Then isn't the judgment of condemnation more along the lines of the people that don't believe in Jesus simply die only maybe a second time. There's, there's something called oh, the yeah. second death. 
where yeah, if, because if they rejected the Messiah, they are not destined to life. This was according to their own free will, and now they're going to die a second time. But those that yes. believed in Jesus rise from the dead to life eternal in the kingdom of God in that coming age. Yes, that's exactly what I, how I okay. see it, too. But, so, you know, mm -hmm. but, but that is, in a sense, a, a re retributive Well, you know, in a sense, justice. it's a retributive. Yeah, it is uh, a retrib retributive justice. But it also has a, the, the hallmark of being a judgment that we bring upon ourselves, yeah. whether or not we believe in Messiah, right? Yeah, but, uh, you know, sometimes people will try to mitigate the force of it by, by saying, well, it's just, it's what they bring upon themselves. Well, of course, it's what they bring upon themselves. But even the New Testament depicts Jesus as the direct agent. Mm -hmm. Uh, through through whom that retributive justice is meted oh, sure. out. Okay, sure. so we don't want to downplay that, you know, uh, because no. in the Gospels we have Jesus saying things like, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus was a rabbi, right, speaking yes. to Jewish people and telling, you know, telling them, uh, how to live before God in a righteous mm -hmm. way. And that includes, on a personal level, when Jesus said, love your enemies, you know, we have to understand that from uh, an ancient Semitic perspective, okay? He's not saying necessarily to, you know, when you, to say, love your enemies. He's not, he doesn't mean necessarily to have this deep feeling and emotion of affection and, uh, you know, some, some feeling toward your enemy, in, in a sense. In, in a Semitic understanding, to love meant to do something, okay? It, it was a concrete um, okay. action more than it was an a abstract feeling or emotion. And so, where in like one gospel, you had Jesus saying, love your enemies. In another gospel, you have Jesus saying, do good to your enemies. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the same thing. Okay. One, the do good is interpreting what it means to love your enemies. So uh, Paul says it like this. He says, if, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Mm -hmm. Okay. He doesn't say if your enemy, he doesn't say, you know, have some good, some warm, cozy feeling about your enemy. No, 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 he, no. He's saying if you come across your enemy, someone who you know hates you, okay, and he's in need, you should, you should help him out. So you this is actually, something this is actually a reflection of God's mercy towards all of humanity, right? Yeah, yeah. So the the, the, in, in the sun shines upon the the wicked, and the and the just at the same time. Right. And so and this doesn't goodness, mean that 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 person stops is going to stop being your enemy. Okay. No. But no. It, and it it's more like as you have the opportunity, as the opportunity arises, you do good to your enemy. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, and and that's and that's on a personal level. Okay, so Jesus is not talking about what nations need to do. Okay, like nations no. should never, you know, fight other nations that are trying to take take over their land or whatever. You know, uh, you can't you can't take those statements of Yeshua and extrapolate them into into nations. It, it doesn't work. Uh, those are ways that Yeshua is showing Jewish people. How they can live right before before Yahweh, okay, and be righteous before Yahweh, uh, and that included loving, concretely loving by doing good to your enemies when the opportunity arose. You know, uh, but this is not a new concept with Yeshua. You go into the Law of Moses, the Torah, and Moses said in the Law. That if you see your enemy's ox fallen, uh, you go over there and you help your enemy get his ox up. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so G- Jesus is not bringing up like some kind of new uh, revolutionary idea. Okay. Uh, Moses said the same thing. Right. In fact, Moses said, you know, love your enemies. Yes. Uh, so Jesus is just reiterating what the what the law said. He may be, you know, expanding on it a, a little bit, giving, you know, a better sense of what it meant, you know. In, in so I, I, like, I like the notion that this is actually, loving en- your enemy is actually a very concrete action-based uh, demonstration. And Jesus is setting the example to us what it is to love your enemy. He was willing to die for his enemies that they could come to, come to the truth, come to God, and be washed in his blood and come into a covenant with God through his, his uh, sacrificial willing offering for humanity. So, yeah, that's, that was a very concrete demonstration of love there, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. And that's in but, obedience to his God. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, we can't take those words uh, of Jesus to love your enemies in an absolute sense, okay? Because even God does not do that in an absolute sense, okay? In the way people think, you know, it's meant to, to love your enemy. Uh, God is going to destroy the enemies of his enemies, okay? I mean, that is a clear teaching of Scripture, not just in the Hebrew Bible, but in the New Testament. It's a clear teaching. Uh, There is coming a judgment, okay, in which the enemies of God will be no more, okay? Mm -hmm. For the time being, okay, in this world right now, God is being merciful to his enemies. Okay. Sure. But it's not absolute. There is going to be a day when when the enemies of God will be no more, okay? Because they will be destroyed. That's a hard pill. Some people don't like to to swallow that <laughs> that well, pill, but uh, you know, when you it, when you go back to the message that we began with, that the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of God is near, when that kingdom arrives in its fullness, that kingdom will will be that kingdom will need the participation of those that have willingly accepted their their role of walking in God's ways uh, and and actually representing God in that kingdom so it only makes sense that the things that exist in God's coming kingdom will be those things that those people or if I can say those individuals that have had that have said yes to God now, and are preparing to inhabit that kingdom, and to reflect God's glory and His image, while they are walking in that kingdom in time to come. So it makes perfect sense that all the others will will be vanquished; they will cease to exist. Yes, and they'll uh, be eliminated. They will yeah, not have annihilated. access to the kingdom of, yes. of God. Yes, and that's not really. I don't think that's really an act of some, some terrible, you know, terrible God who is. It it's, it seems to me that that's actually reflective. God has given us a choice, a free will, whether or not we want to participate, or whether or not we want to cease from participating, and that's righteous on God's part. Yeah, I mean, look, in the present age right now. We already have uh, that mixture of unbelievers and believers. Yes. Okay. And we know how it ends, how it works out, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. work out good for the believers. Right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, so why would God carry that on into the kingdom age, right? No. No. In the kingdom age, uh, the unbelievers are eliminated. Okay. Because it's 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 supposed to be different than the present age. The right. Age, right. Amen. It's supposed to be a time of yes. uh, peace and uh, love and 
joy and, and all of the good things that we want so much, right? Yes. And that we and that seem to uh, elude us in this present age. All of those things will be there in the age to come. And one reason they will be there is because there'll be no ba- there no one there to ruin the party. Right. Okay? Right, uh, right. Uh, they they will be eliminated. Well, isn't that I was just thinking about the the, the sermon that Paul had on Mars Hill in Athens there, where he's, he starts to introduce God to them. This is the unknown God, and he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, and how he has appointed a man to judge the world in righteousness, and he gave a proof of this by raising him from the dead. So Jesus is the ideal man for the job, because he was completely obedient to God, even to the point of death, what better judge could there be than, than our Messiah, Jesus, to judge humanity and to separate human, you know, the, the, the humans into two camps, right? Those that will cease to exist and those that will be, who are prepared for the kingdom. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's a beautiful message. And it also lends power to the gospel message like we invite people into the kingdom of god with the, this hope of resurrection and life at the return of jesus is that not not correct yes definitely mm-hmm. yes okay um, and and you know this whole idea about um, the postponement of the kingdom at the mm-hmm. time when yeshua came this this also is a A, a powerful way to answer uh, the objections raised by Jewish people today. Uh-huh. One of the one of the main things that Jewish people will bring up uh, when you know you try to share the gospel with them is that. Yeshua did not fulfill the prophecies, so he cannot be the Messiah. He didn't restore the kingdom to Israel. He didn't restore the Davidic throne. He didn't bring an end to war uh, between the nations. You know, all of these things that are are predicted in the prophets. Uh, Because Yeshua did not do these things, and then how can he be the the Messiah? (laughs) Right. And so the postponement of the kingdom answers that question that question uh, because he he would have done all those things uh, had he been accepted by the Jewish people at that time yes but right. having been rejected uh, God postponed the fulfillment of those things until a later time and le- later rabbis after the time of uh, Yeshua uh, even even said things like this uh, I can't give you the exact uh, reference or, you know, where you can find this, but uh, in some rabbinic writings, uh, it was stated that when the Messiah comes, if the people of Israel at that time are worthy, then such and such will happen. And if they are unworthy, then such and such will happen. Yeah, okay? right. So uh, they, they had that understanding that they had a part to play when the Messiah sure. came. Sure. In, in how things were going to pan out when he yes. came, and so uh, it's not. It shouldn't be hard for them to understand this concept. You know that hey, the Messiah or Yeshua is the Messiah, and he would have fulfilled all these things had the people of Israel acknowledged him as a king at that time. Yes. Them rejecting him, it was pulled back. It was postponed. Now it's going to happen at a future time. And so be ready and be ready because he's coming back and and will you receive him when he comes back the second time? Yeah. Now the second time, I don't think there's going to be any contingency involved in the second time. No. God is is going to accomplish his will in the second time. And I but I do believe that all of Israel will accept the Messiah at that time. Uh, That's my prayer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. Well, this has been a wonderful interview, Brother Troy. Um, I just wonder if we're almost at an hour now. 
Maybe you can share some closing thoughts and we'll wrap this up. Uh, closing thoughts about this subject? Or? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, just uh, not a lot more to say about it. Uh, just, you know, the believers in Messiah have have a hope. Okay? And you know, what the word hope really entails is, first of all, you know, the way we use the word hope in, in modern day English is a lot of times, you know, we say, oh, I, I hope such and such happens or whatever. And what we mean by that is, you know, we have a desire that it, something will happen, but we're not really sure if it's going yes. to, but man, uh -huh. we really would like it to happen. Okay? Yes. But it, biblically, the word hope doesn't mean that at all. In the Bible, when you see the word hope, it's denoting a surety, something that is uh, based on a promise of God. So that's what makes it sure. But yes. the reason it's called hope is because it's something that's in the future. Uh -huh. So Paul says in Romans 8, when he's talking about the... Uh, the final uh, redemption of the believer, the redemption of our bodies. Uh -huh. and, and he says, you know, that this is what we're waiting for. And he says that, uh, that in this hope we are saved. In this yes. expectation of what the future holds, we are now saved. Uh -huh. Okay? And he says, but who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for, uh, for what is yet to come, then we'll wait for it. We'll patiently wait for it. Okay. Yes. So hope is, is something that's in the future. Okay. And the important, it's a vitally important that Christians understand the hope and maintain that hope because that hope is the only thing that's going to keep you from straying off the path. Uh, it's a lively well, hope. Yeah. Uh, like the, the way the author of Hebrews puts it is that as the hope, that hope is an anchor for the mm -hmm. soul, right? So like an anchor keeps a ship from drifting off on, onto the sea. Yes. Uh, so hope is like that, right? It, it, it anchors us down and keeps us from drifting off of the, of the path yes. uh, that we're on. And, always keeping that hope before us and, and uh, you know, having that hope as a, as a living hope, like you said, yes. uh, in our hearts and our minds is, is the thing that's going to get us through this life uh, with its suffering, its rejection, uh, its uh, pain and suffering and, and all of those things, which uh, again is why we know we're not in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Hello, in the kingdom yes. of God, there is no persecution of the of the righteous. In the kingdom of God, there is no pain and suffering of the righteous. Okay, in the kingdom of God, uh, there is no uh, hardships of the righteous. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is how we know we're not in the kingdom of God yet. Yes. Uh, because we are suffering all of these things. Uh, some of us more so than others, you know, here in, in America, we got it pretty easy still, mm -hmm. although, you know, we're on, uh, more of a verge of a level of persecution that we've, we've never seen before in this country. Uh, but yet believers throughout the world have been suffering deep persecution and suffering, uh, for many, many centuries. Um, yes. So uh, we need to keep the hope before us, the hope of the return of our Lord and Savior Yeshua, the hope of immortality and of the kingdom to come and of all that we, we are going to share with God and with his son at that time. Okay. That's a beautiful closing statement, Brother Troy. Thank the Lord and you for being my guest. It was a, 
It was a may honor. God bless you Great. and may he continue. Oh, before we before we part, repeat your blog again for the audience so they have. Yes, if you Google "Let the Truth Come Out" blog, uh, you you'll get it. You it'll pull up. Okay. Uh, you could just Google my name, really, and you should get my blog. Will pull up also, but uh, either way. Okay. But yeah, I would encourage people to go there. Uh, look on the right column on my blog page. Uh, there's the titles of all my blog articles. I have a three-part article uh, on the kingdom of God, uh, and then I have an article on the postponement of the kingdom. And I would invite people to go and read that and, uh, and hope that it blesses them. Okay.